Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Broker Breakdown. A little bit of a change up of schedule here. We had a few things come up. Mike unfortunately got sick, um, so we've kind of had to push some schedules around and whatnot. But we're back finally, um, and kind of an episode that is going to overlap on a few episodes we've done in the past. But again, something that I think is very important for people to kind of understand from the almost like the the background that you might not really think about. And again, things that we might not always think about too, Mike. Um, and that is more of a discussion point of how insurance companies right now are basically dealing with claims and the conversation of, is it worth repairing or is it worth just writing a vehicle off when it comes to a claim situation? And, it, and this is something too, I know it's a hot topic on the claims and the adjusting side. We obviously see little bits and pieces, James. I know I'm I'm um, more. I, I kind of follow up with people as it's going on to see if I can be of any assistance, um, which is part of the broker role. But the one side we don't always see is how that actually transpires from the back end, right? Being on the insurance company side, so it's it's something that is um, certainly mm-hmm. known by clients because they're going through that experience firsthand. But you're right. We don't always we don't always see, you know, how that transpires at the end of the day. So it's it's definitely a, an interesting topic for sure. And realistically, like how did we get here? And like like I said, this is going to really touch base with a lot of episodes we've done in the past, but again, it's no surprise that supply chain disruption, high inflation rates have caused not only our industry, but basically every industry on planet Earth to have to evolve to kind of a different model. Again, the auto industry has evolved and it continues to evolve over the last five years based on a number of factors. And even like I was telling Mike before we got on the episode here, I was actually inquiring to one of my dealers the other day and asking about um, one of their products. And she was telling me it's over a year wait for one of their vehicles and i was like really like it's not like i'm talking like a luxury vehicle i was just talking like a regular mainstream vehicle that a lot of people drive and she's like yeah unfortunately it's over a year wait and i was kind of like almost i was shocked i i I thought like maybe four to six months but when she said over a year i was like whoa like really that is insane but again like this is just the world we kind of live in right now mike well it's also yeah, like we've we've talked about this many times in the past year, but it's <clears throat> there's also the element of what was previously supply chain issues, getting parts, getting vehicles, all the stuff that we've had many many conversations on. But now there's the element as well of I think what's going to be part of this episode or or a decent size, you know, just the tech in vehicles and and how long it takes to get specific parts. I know computer chips were a, a hot topping, a hot, hot uh, talking point there for a while, but just in general, right? I mean, vehicles have gotten so elaborate um, with what tech is involved in them now that if that type of vehicle is involved in a claim and the tech is there to hopefully prevent that from happening, but accidents do obviously happen, how how fast does it take them to then redo, right? And this is what gets into it, James. Like, do, does is it a write off? Is it something they can repair? And the insurance companies have, you know, a, a decent hold on what they want to do because they're the ones paying the bills at the end of the day. Yeah. And you know what? It, it brings up a great talking point and one that actually one of my clients had recently. Um, and their vehicle was they, they hit a deer with their vehicle and the vehicle was going to be valued at almost a $40,000 repair. So that cost of repair almost cost more than what the car would be worth brand new when they bought it. Like, I don't remember what, how old it was. It was like 2014, I think, 2016, something like that. But again, six to eight years on, a repair is costing almost more than what the brand new value of that vehicle was. So we've like, right. that alone is just insane to think that a repair is almost costing more than what the vehicle is actually worth, realistically. Yeah, and, and there's... A whole other element that I won't get into for today, but I know that um, 
I think Aviva did like an undercover series there, James, a number of years ago. And this is only just a, a small talking point. But what they found is that there was a handful of um, shops out there, obviously all kind of overcharging, right, for what those repairs would have been. So the overall repair bills were more and ended up being, you know, fraud cases and stuff like that, which I know is still a big thing for the insurance industry in general. But it brings me back to what I kind of wanted to say, that repairs aren't cheap, right? Um Getting those parts, get, you know, even just hourly wages now with inflation for for mechanics and finding decently qualified, you know, good working people in those occupations costs a lot more money. So the overhead is that much more for you know for those independent shops. As a result, getting those repairs fixed through insurance obviously are going to cost significantly more as well. So there's multiple different. Um, areas about you know why a vehicle is written off now versus just repaired because at the end of the day the insurance company is going to say well it's going to cost us you know twenty thousand dollars to repair to repair like a 2011 vehicle like we're physically not doing that we're taking that vehicle cutting you a check finalizing this process as quick as possible and then just giving you money to go buy a new one going back to the uh the conversation that you brought up first was the tech side of things Tech is, we love tech. Technology is great. We've grown up with it. Like we've, it, it helps our lives in so many ways. But the problem is, especially in vehicles and damages like this, it almost like hinders the performance of a vehicle because of how tech driven vehicles are now, are, are nowadays. Even look back 20 years ago, Mike, like 20 years ago, we still had like the physical manual roll down windows, right? Like it's just, like we don't like we don't see vehicles like that anymore. But the problem with those tech things, especially when you get into accidents, you repair one part of the vehicle. Oh, but one part that might not even be involved in the accident is now not working, so I have to go repair that. Oh, well then that repair is now costs another part of the vehicle to not work properly, so now I have to go repair that. So it's kind of like it's like a pipeline. If you cut one piece of the pipeline, the rest of the pipeline doesn't really get fed what you need to get fed, right? So you have to fix everything else. So I find that's the biggest issue. Like even for me, like if I try to fix my computer, I fix one part. Oh, well then the other part has to get fixed. Oh, and then you fix that part. Oh, another part's got to get fixed, right? So it might not be involved in the actual accident, but nine times out of 10, you're usually having to tinker with other parts of the vehicle just because you got to make sure that it all connects and works properly after you make a big repair like that. Exactly, exactly. And I remember doing a few years back, and this was probably about uh, five or six years ago. So it was a while back now. I remember there, we had a um, a training session within the office talking about just overall the tech and windshields, right? And it was it was a windshield repair shop that had come by to kind of just kind of educate everyone within the office. And it was at a time where a lot of these uh, sensors were being put into windshields, and and you know the average cost of a windshield wasn't the three to five hundred dollars that everyone thought it was, right? So I mean, there's a prime example of the fact that a lot of vehicles that have all the sensors and cameras and, and technology within them, if you get like a cracked windshield, I mean, you're probably looking at what James, like almost, I mean, over a thousand dollars with almost every windshield. Yeah. Now. Like mine was, mine was $3,000 to fix. And that's a great point to bring up is that even when my windshield got replaced, they had to like install it obviously, but then they had to send it to another person because, or they had to send it to directly to Ram because Ram was the only people that could properly like, um, like fix it. Right. Like to basically make sure everything was working properly after that. So right there, you're seeing that, yeah, my windshield got replaced and got broken, but they had to basically like fix all the other issues that goes on with my windshield, including the sensors and cameras and all the climate control and everything just from fixing the windshield. And all that stuff also has like costs, right? Like calibration costs to it as well. So, I mean, it's not just sticking a piece of glass in and re-gluing it down, right? There's there's so much more to it. That and was the word I was trying to find. And I couldn't yeah. find it. 
collaboration. That's what I wanted. No, calibrating. Calibrating. Sorry, calibration. Yes, yeah. that was the word I was trying to find, but I couldn't think of it. So thank you. I, I was lucky. I had a, I have a 2013 Elantra, still drive it, and I had a windshield crack that was a, a full windshield replacement now about five years ago. But because there was almost nothing in it, it wasn't the end of the day, and I could decide what I wanted to do through insurance if I wanted to pay it out. I actually forget what I did. But um, the part the part was that it wasn't expensive just because there wasn't anything in it. Like the car was so basic, right? But that's not the case anymore. And I think any new vehicle that you're driving, as much as I am fully on board with, with tech to help provide a safer experience, we have to also realize that that costs a lot of money for um, not only body shops to repair if you're doing it outside of insurance or if it's going through an insurance company and they're footing the bill. It's it's just that much more, right? It, so it's nothing costs a thousand dollars to repair something. Everything is more, and I think that's something that a lot of clients struggle with as well. James is the fact that um, things cost that much more to repair, so it's it's almost more. You know, um, you're going to want to put that through insurance because it's not like it's a thousand dollars where you can pay it out of pocket and move on. You know everything you're looking at damage wise could be could be thousands of dollars, and the average person doesn't have that money right at the time. So there's even repairs, not just write offs, but even repairs in general are just so costly. Another great talking point I want to bring up, which we've talked about numerous times throughout the last six months and probably even the last twelve months, is rental car prices and just availability of rental cars. Um, we've seen that rental cars have become more costly. They become harder to find specific vehicles, especially the bigger vehicles, because they're not only rented in in the event of accidents more, but they're also just rented in general from people that want to just rent vehicles. Um, And that's become a big problem is because if insurance companies have to extend rental coverages because things are taking longer, that's costing more money. Um, So again, go over things that I've said and Mike said a thousand times in the past is obviously making sure you have the right amount of rental coverage when you need it. But again, knowing that things are just going to take longer and insurance companies have to pay that. It's not like we just hit the button and it's extended and no one has to pay that extension of the rental car. Like the rental car company has to get paid too, Mike. So it's a that's another huge point that people really don't see is that how much rental cars are a big factor into insurance and repairing vehicles. And you know what? You made a point there that I hadn't thought of before, but as an adjuster for an insurance company, if I was in that role, I mean, I can understand why that would be a massive, you know, overall price point because if it's looking at repairing a vehicle versus replacing one. So when you, when you make the decision to repair it, you got to make sure that you have the parts in, you approximately know how long it's going to take from the shop, but you're also thinking how long is that rental going to last the client while this is being done? And we've had conversations before that it's like, you know, three, four or five weeks, nothing happens in two weeks anymore, like nothing. So I mean, if you're putting someone into a car that's, you know, arguably, I don't know, let's say a hundred bucks a day, a month is, you know, $3,000. And that's not even too far fetched now to say that a vehicle is going to be not repaired within a month. So that's a, a spot I never even thought of. But if it's, if you're talking about paying that out, I mean, it might be more beneficial from the insurance company to decide to say, well, we don't know how long this is going to take to repair. We can cut them a check, right, to go buy a new vehicle, therefore lowering the time that the rental is required because now the claim is closed. And at that point... It's then up to the client to go find a new UV, new v, uh, vehicle or used vehicle, whatever they have to do, James. But it, it kind of finalizes that process. So I, I hadn't thought about that till right when you said that. But all of that from the adjuster's standpoint will come into play for sure. Well, just take easy numbers. You just said if it's 100 bucks a day, 30 days, even if they have to extend it 30 days, that's another $3,000 the insurance company has to then take on to basically have someone in a vehicle, right? And again, there's circumstances where companies will extend rentals. There's um, circumstances where insurance companies won't extend rentals. So it's always important, first and foremost, is making sure you have the right amount of coverage 
five hundred dollars in rental coverage is not going to get you anywhere. So making sure that you have at least two, three thousand dollars in rental coverage, again, that change in premium is going to be so minimal, but it's going to be such a a headache reliever when you need to be in a rental and they go, well, this is going to take a month and you know what? It's going to be perfectly fine. We won't have to extend rental at all because you have the right amount of coverage and your broker did you justice on giving you that amount. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's actually so minimal to increase that from like, let's say $1,500 to 25 or 3000, um, which I think would be the new norm anyways, in my opinion. But I mean, let's say it's 40 bucks for the entire year extra that's that's got to become a no-brainer for people moving forward i think more agents and brokerages need to step on up on that and i say that confidently be seeing documents every day that have smaller limits in order to save premium james twelve hundred fifteen hundred dollars i mean that's really not doing that's doing a disservice to your client because by saying oh don't worry you have rental car coverage but not discussing the limit all you're doing is giving setting someone up for what could be a failure very, basically well if they need to use it and then it's like okay you have twelve hundred dollars that's going to buy you about 12 to 14 days i mean that 12 to 14 days is going to come and go considering these these supply chain issues and at that, then at that point when the company says hey you got to give back the vehicle which happens all the time in insurance claims all the time then you're going to have a not only a negative experience to the insurance company but also possibly the broker being like, yeah, sorry, like this is this is all we had for you. So, I mean, it's that's that's more of like a sales plug. It's got to be twenty five hundred, let's say minimum three thousand in that range. Um, but every client situation is different too. So, if you're a family of four and you have four vehicles, can you all get around or can you like make it work? Right? If you're a single person that's going to work or picking up kids or whatnot, you could probably argue you need a vehicle every single day of your life getting around is impossible without it. Um, So that's where it becomes more important. And we've said that before. Yeah. And again, that's a conversation I have with all my clients, right? How much do you rely on this vehicle for your everyday life? And if you tell me, and if you tell me that you need to go to work every single day, pick up your kids from school every single day, or you even go to school yourself every single day, you need to have the right amount of coverage because at the end of the day, you can't go back and be like, oh, I have five other cars that sit in the driveway that I can drive. You probably don't have that because most people don't. I don't really know any people that realistically have two, three cars sitting at home unless they're like family vehicles and they can just go, oh, you know what? We'll be fine without it because we have other vehicles. The regular person doesn't have just backup vehicles sitting in the garage with a tarp over it hoping for the day that an accident happens. Then go, oh, I can get the old old beater out of the the, uh, garage for this circumstance, right? So... It's so, so important making sure that you have the right amount of coverage because, again, I was in that circumstance. I actually had this happen to me where my – this was even like – this was during COVID. This was like literally the first year of COVID even happening. And my my truck got um, T-boned and I was in a rental for a year or not not a year, a month. And then they basically said, unfortunately, we've extended it as long as we possibly can. Like, you either have to pay out of pocket or right. not have a rental. And I couldn't not have a rental because I had to go to Burlington every single day to work. And I had to pay out of pocket for a rental, which cost me like $900 by the time I got my truck back. Right. So right, right there, me being just naive and thinking that the insurance company was going to have my back and like extend it and continue ex- even even knowing it was not my fault like i was t-boned i like i said i had to pay 900 dollars out of pocket just to keep my vehicle to get to tune from work right so yeah, that's a, right. again a personal story that i've directly had just because i was naive and thought the insurance company was going to have my back but unfortunately <laughs> didn't um the one thing too i know and i know the episode's really big on the right off side so i wanted to make uh, just a talking point of james Forrest as well is that when a vehicle is written off or or the decision is made to write it off, it, the, the rest of the claims process typically was pretty quickly. You're going to get a claims check uh, once it's decided on how much that is. Obviously, newer vehicles, actually, and even used right now, the valuation of what you're going to get is is 
not only decide to buy the insurance company, but also yourself. There is a little back and forth to find a a proper valuation that both parties agree to. But what I what I wanted to say was that that check that you get at that point, um, I mean, if you don't have a vehicle, the one thing that people need to realize is that you're probably not going to get what you had previously only because of these supply chain issues. So it's important to keep in mind that if you're in one of these unfortunate situations where you had, an, a, a new, let's just say a newer vehicle to James that's written off and the dealership doesn't have one there, going somewhere else, finding one. I mean, that could that could very easily take you a while to find that. Or you might have to go to something different in order to continue living your life the way you were before. So the the way that vehicles, the way that claims are kind of adjusted now is going to shift because when a claims check is provided, it's giving you that ability to going out and rebuying one, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to find what you had before. And that was going to be a great talking point that we were going to bring up is that Yes, this all sounds positive from a consumer standpoint, right? Like my vehicle is going to get written off. The process is going to take away less time because they're basically just going to cut me a check. I don't have to wait for my vehicle to get fixed. I don't have to wait the long times for the parts to come in. My rental car, realistically, I'm not going to have a rental car because I don't need one because it's just it's getting written off. But there is a negative side to that. And we started off the episode literally saying supply chain disruption is still a problem. Okay, well, even if they write your vehicle off, and Mike just said, what are your options? Because even like I said earlier in the episode, I was just inquiring about one of my clients or my network's products, and they said it's going to be over a year. So if that's the vehicle you want, can you afford to wait a whole year to get a new vehicle? Probably not. So what are your options? You either have to basically hunt down another dealership that has a vehicle that you want or end up going to the used market and buying something a little bit older but used and then again it comes into the question of new versus used vehicles and the finance rates there's rumors that they're going to increase rates again today which i actually think they actually approved as we're as this um episode has been recorded that I'm pretty sure the Bank of Canada is actually is going to increase rates again. So again, maybe not impacting financing, but definitely houses. But that also has a flip on finances. We've seen, I remember when I bought my truck, I was like 0.9%. And now I'm going to some places and they're like 8 9%. And then used cars, I'm seeing bills of sales for clients with used vehicles. They're like 9 10 12%. Right. So it's like right. you went from a zero basically percent finance, car gets written off, and you're like, oh, this sounds great because now I can go buy a new car. But on the flip side of things, one, what kind of car are you buying and what kind of wait times you're going to have? And two, what's your finance going to look like? Because the world's changed probably since you bought that vehicle and rates have skyrocketed since then, Mike. Yeah, that another another really good point that I didn't think of. Because, for example, like mine was zero percent at the time for eight years. I mean, I don't. I think that's pretty much unheard of nowadays. Um, but yeah, you make a great point because if it's written off, there's two aspects here. We we had a previous episode on this just for a, a quick segment, but there is the replacement cost coverage, James. That's on insurance policies, a waiver depreciation, as called, or or number forty three for us in the industry which is there to give you a proper amount for basically the MSRP bill of sale value that you purchased the vehicle for. But there's also that gap coverage that's usually offered by dealerships, which is there and intended to cover the difference in the financing. And that might be different, right? Because if you're getting a claims check from the insurance company, you're getting an amount for the vehicle. You're not getting amount for the financing that you over and above paid for. So if you're talking about a 10% interest rate, and I've seen a few bill of sales with pretty high interest. I mean, you have to hope that the dealership is is proactively giving you enough insight, James, on that gap where maybe it makes sense to pay that monthly for these varying interest rates. Because like you said, if you're at, let's even say two or up to two or up to 10 in some cases, if your vehicle is written off, that 10% 
could certainly add up to be thousands of dollars, depending on how much you financed over the over the term length. But again, people don't think about this stuff, right? They like again, a write off seems like oh, this is going to be great because I can go out and buy whatever vehicle I want now. But the problem is, is what's the wait time on that vehicle? What's your finance going to look like? All these kind of things. So there's positives and there's negatives to this situation and kind of how things are going to play out are is going to be interesting but i think people need like i said you got to you kind of have to be on both sides of the argument you got to say okay this is great because my car doesn't isn't going to get fixed and my check's going to come in and i can go buy a vehicle but on the flip side is what kind of vehicle can i buy what's actually available where do i have to go and buy it because a lot of people have been going either like out of city even out of province sometimes i have dealers that i work with that they say well people are coming from like out east or out west to buy this vehicle because they don't have them in their province so they're coming here to buy them then shipping it back to whatever wherever they live but on top of that what is the finance change going to be and like you said mike there's times where you had a 0.9 or 1.9 or whatever it is but if the rate now is 8% that's that could possibly cost you thousands of extra dollars that you don't really consider, right? Right. And and there's also now a buying almost obligation because I don't know how it exactly works, but I would assume that if you're not able to cover the full amount, let's say the claims check is not enough to cover all the additional financing you had, um, you might feel the obligation to go back to that same dealership because they want to roll it into the next vehicle, James, yeah, for you. negative equity. Right. And if you don't pay that off, I have to assume that if you're not rolling it into the next vehicle... Then there's also the potential that dealership could could hurt your credit, right? Because you're, you're not paying off what was still owed for the previous financed vehicle. Yeah, what will mostly happen is that, like, if it's a small amount, any dealership will usually just roll it into another, like, into another deal, basically. So but here's the thing: that's what happens if you don't want to go back to that dealership again. You, other dealers can roll it in if it's a small amount. They're not going to roll okay. it in if it's like ten, twenty thousand dollars. But if it's like a few thousand, I, most people just say, "Well, we'll roll it into what the other, what the cost of the new one's going to be." But again, that's Which another is, yeah. problem because if your payout is less than what you are owing on the um, on the vehicle that's now written off, you now have again negative equity. So that becomes yeah. a, a negative too, right? You never like again. No one wants this stuff to happen. But again, I also don't think people really think about this kind of stuff until it really happens and goes, wow, like my car's worth 30000 or I still have 30000 left in the loan, but they're only paying me 25000 Like I have $5,000 basically in negative equity now that I have to deal with that I, sh- I never thought I was going to have to deal with, right? So, Well, and rolling in equity into multiple vehicles too, which, which unfortunately happens quite a bit, could mean that people then are out that much more and there's a point when you're actually owing more than the vehicle's even worth. Right, like yep. you're, so it's it's not always about what you can afford per month. There's a lot more talking points to it. I think that's why this episode is so important is to say, you know, insurance is part of the aspect. Don't get me wrong, but there are some buying practices and purchases that people need to consider before just saying what they can afford per month and what would happen if I didn't have a vehicle. That's what this episode's kind of kind of about. Yep, exactly. And again. We've we've talked about it before, but again, how much percentage of the actual premium written goes into claims? Like, and we've said about 55, 50% of the premium written goes directly back to claims. So you're o- over half of what people pay for insurance are going directly back into our claims, right? So right. Right. again, how does that impact things? If we write more vehicles off, do our claims go like does our claim ratio basically go up now because the claim is going to be bigger if you write a vehicle off, right? So that percentage is going to go up. So is that going to be a positive or a negative for the insurance companies? Well, then on top of that, another talking point is do rates continue to go up then? Because if you're continuing to write off 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar vehicles, all the time because it's not worth repairing them, your claim ratio is going to go up. How do you counterbalance claim ratios going up and profitability going down? You have to raise rates again. Yeah, right. Well, and this is, I mean, the big thing with the conversations we've had previously on theft 
uh, the new tag system and and just theft deterrence in general is that theft wasn't always was always historically not the biggest part of a policy. Therefore, there wasn't really a lot of um, co- clients wouldn't pay a lot towards theft aspects of insurance, right? Fire and theft was always kind of like a standard because it was so inexpensive in, in perspective to collision. And we're now seeing a little bit of not only a shift where collision is still obviously very high because collision claims happen and, and people have more expensive vehicles, but also now we got that theft aspect as well. And I don't see that ever going back down, James, with the with what we're seeing through insurance companies with either theft surcharges or maybe new underwriting requirements in order to get theft coverage or whatever it might be. Some of these things are not going away anytime soon. They're actually going to be probably new. We're going to see new things coming that are going to be sticking by those companies. Well, again, reading the article that we're going off of this episode on, um, it says right here, the industry in Ontario alone paid more in in 2020 than they did half of 2022. So 2020 halfway, so six months of 2022, they paid more on theft than they did of the whole of 2020. And again, right. they're saying here too that 2022 Q1, 2023 Q1 has already exceeded that of 2022. So we're seeing theft is becoming more of an issue. And again, if you even want to take just from a consumer standpoint, if you want to look at the premium difference between what collision and comprehensive coverage costs on your policy, you'll see collision is normally way less or sorry, way more than what comprehensive is. But again, is that going to be a trend that we're going to see change and insurance companies are going to have to raise rates on their comprehensive coverage because there's too many thefts going on. We've already That's seen right. a lot of That's companies right. try to combat that with these tag programs and the surcharge on highly stolen vehicles. But is that going to be enough? Are they going to just have to... And I, I understand where they're coming from is that they don't want to just raise comprehensive rates. But if it continues to go down this route, are like, is it really just going to have to be... We have to raise the comprehensive rates and and increase them because we can't continue to take theft claims and not see rate. And again, that comes in yeah. generally as rate. And again, me and Mike have said this over and over again. We probably predict over the next three to five years, we will continue to see rate go up because of how the industry was impacted coming out of COVID, what they did during COVID, which again, kind of backfired in their face on them how inflation's impacting all this kind of stuff. So is this going to also impact more rate for the next three to five years realistically, Mike? Yeah. And I mean, theft is, theft is, I mean, theft in specific of vehicles, um, from, from my, again, from my 10 years now in the industry, I can always say that theft was always of much, much lower category. Let's say collision was 500 for a vehicle for the year. Maybe thefts and fire and theft and comprehensive that section with a thousand was a thousand sorry a hundred dollars for the year, so it was considerably less historically, but with more and more vehicles being stolen in the higher and higher kind of value mark right forty fifty sixty seventy eighty ninety thousand dollars and and it's not just like the four thousand dollar beaters that are being stolen. It's it's pretty black and white to me, James. That's going to have to go up because if you're getting like simple math, if you're collecting like let's say a hundred or two hundred dollars for the year on, on a fire and theft premium from a client, and that vehicle that's stolen is worth eighty grand, I mean, where are you ever? Pre- get, where are you ever getting that that client profitable again? Well, you know what I mean. Thing. You have to have how many years is that going? to... How many years is that client going to have to pay comprehensive coverage premium? Well, four hundred. Four hundred yeah, years. It's never happening, right? So four hundred years of a client paying under that theft thing for the rest of their life, hoping nothing, something never happens again. It it's not possible. So even if you break that down, and say, well, Mike, that's that's too expensive. The average car is let's say 50. And I think I'm being generous on that because there's a lot of cars that are more than that nowadays, especially the ones on the high risk um, theft list that we get. Most of them would be between the 60 and 80 range at that point. Um, I mean, if the, even 50,000, James, 
divided by that same $200 a year, let's say, give or take, is 250 years. Yeah. So, I mean, you, can, you can't even afford one theft claim from a client in a lifetime at that in order to get your money back from that one claim. So historically, where people would say, okay, I pay a lot of money for insurance, and we would say, I agreed, collisions big, liabilities big, accident benefits are big. Fire theft and kind of the whole comprehensive section, which is like deer, windshield, those type of things were cheaper because insurance companies didn't pay out as much in those categories. So they would give you a better price on those, understanding the risk that it's not going to be a large a large payout. That is what I see shifting because that is shifting right before our eyes. And it's actually shifting so fast that the math behind the scenes is not adding up. So insurance companies are making some, you know, you could say drastic measures in order to limit that. I mean, we've had these conversations, James, but a few companies at, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars for their higher risk kind of theft surcharges, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just what's happening right now to say, holy man, we need to get more money back in here because we're paying out way more on theft than we're getting in. Yeah, it's it's a very, again, I use this word a lot. It's a very reactive measure that insurance companies are using right now because they don't really know what to do with how high theft has gotten. You can raise the rates, but like how how high do you rate? How high do you continue to raise the rates on theft? Right? It's and again, I know consumers are not happy. I've spoken to a lot of people. And again, every insurance company is doing kind of their own way. That there's some companies that are basically saying, "We'll install this tracker for you for free." Other times, it's okay. We're going to give you a discounted rate on the tracker. Other times, it's okay. We'll if you can pick a tracker, we can approve it or not approve it. And there's other companies that are just straight up saying, "If you have one of these vehicles, we're basically going to surcharge you X amount of dollars based off of you owning one of these vehicles." So. I think from a consumer standpoint, it's very important to obviously make sure that you talk to your agent or broker and making sure that you go over your options, making sure you know which company is doing what basically direction and then make your decision from there with a with more education behind it. But like you said, Mike, this is only the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing a lot of change happen in the industry right now in the last six months. And you're only going to see more come later on the Q3 and 4 of 2023 and realistically going into 2024. Yeah, it's there's going to be a lot of changes. I think personally, whenever some of the companies have shifts into doing um, like a theft surcharge, for example, that you've seen with a few of the bigger guys, similar things come down the pipeline six months to a year later from the other big guys as well as the mutuals. It just depends on when they get on board and how they want to implement a, pr- a program around that. But that typically is what happens to, to combat the whole thing. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of changes again. We always see changes in our business. It, nothing is stagnant uh, for too long. But I, I would... I, I don't see rates going down, James. I, I see them kind of staying similar, if not increasing again over the next six to 12 months. Um, I mean, I, I just don't see any trends happening outside that that would say, hey, we're going to see rates increase, uh, sorry, decrease drivers. And it's not to say that drivers aren't being good. There's a lot of good drivers out there. So this is not trying to penalize the bad drivers by giving this info. What it is to do is just kind of give a understanding that a lot of things are still happening that insurance companies are paying out on. And as a result of these payouts, they're collecting from the entire pool as a whole to collect for those you know, larger losses. So if they're big car claims or if they're big um, fire losses on builder's risks, as we discussed last week, or if it's the continuing trend of you know, high value vehicles being stolen, which is just a monstrous talking point right now. Um, All of those things need to be combated in some way to ensure that the general population doesn't see monster, monster increases to kind of combat that. But in the short term, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing, you know, that kind of five to 10% renewal increase, um, for a lot of just general clients, unfortunately. 
I'm going to keep the spotlight on you and I'm going to ask you what's your takeaway from this episode. Yeah, my final takeaway would be um for for people that are that are obviously in higher end vehicles, I would think my takeaway is either one, you may have to do more things yourself to deter possible claims from happening because you don't want to be in a bad position, right? And you're going to say, "Well, I have insurance, that's what it's for." And I fully agree with you. But I would say that having things like steering wheel locks are going to be way more important or brake locks or things that deter people in general from being able to physically steal that vehicle because theft is so big. For two, anyone that's in a higher value vehicle, the the likelihood of you getting that vehicle um, replaced in a total loss right now is probably not nearly as quick as you think it would be. So if you've talked to someone that's had one and they said, yeah, it took another six months or a year, that's almost not surprising. That might be the new reality. So maybe just have a a plan in place for either A, how can you further take steps yourself to make sure you don't lose the vehicle you love? And B, if that does happen, what are your next steps? So kind of just have a game plan, James, about if something were to happen, am I going to, you know, do I have either a backup plan or at least have some thought into into what you might want to do? Because if you don't have that thought and that unfortunate event does happen when you have to get something repaired or replaced, I, I guess replaced is what I want to say. Um, you might you might be in a in a world of hurt sort of thing. I would say for consumers, really, really think about the pros and cons of a vehicle being written off. Yes, you can go basically look for a brand new vehicle, but two, how long is that going to take? Can you be without a vehicle even for a week? Because again, it's not like this process takes 24 hours. You can go pick like we were gone so far away from being able to go to a dealership, buy it that morning and pick it up that night or like even the next morning. We've got like we're so far away from that now. So I would always say, look at the pros and cons and say, you know what? like. Yes, this is, it looks positive in my eyes that it's being written off, but what's the negatives to that? How long am I going to be without a vehicle? How long is it going to take me to find a new vehicle? Am I going to have to sacrifice and possibly go to a vehicle that I don't want for the time being and then get a new vehicle when I can get one? So I would just say play both sides of the, of the argument. And just like I said, make sure that you weigh your pros and cons before you really go out there and start celebrating that my car has been written off and you get a check way quicker because way quicker up front getting a check might take way longer trying to buy a new vehicle with that check. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a great point, especially given the current place. And unfortunately, James, like you just mentioned, a lot of us don't necessarily know what that looks like until it actually happens. And then you're gonna be um maybe you know surprised at what the outcome is. Exactly, exactly. So again, our schedule did kind of get a little bit mixed up with things that were going on. Mike got sick and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to get a few episodes out. So this episode is actually like we're recording it. It's going to be edited and basically posted like instantly. And then we're recording another episode this week. And that's going to be next week's episode. So you'll see a lot of stuff come out. But it's just because we're trying to get caught up with uh, being off for the last week or so. So um, nothing really on your end. But again, I just want to make people aware that it, we're, we do have a lot going on and things, like I said, things happened and we're just trying to catch up. So you'll see this one basically be edited and basically posted either today, the 12th, or if we can get it out tomorrow, then the 13th. So that's kind of what my target is going to be for this episode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We we look forward to it. We'll we'll chat with you guys more next episode as well, and uh, try to bring some more insight into the world of our our broker insurance world. But thank you guys for tuning in this week, and we'll check you guys next time on the broker breakdown.